All right, so uh, we're going to continue our talk about special populations. Remember, we covered the geriatrics last time. Any questions about that? We'll be dealing with quite a few geriatric patients. However, uh, if you are predisposed, you might be also dealing with some pediatric ones. Who is, uh, who's, got a, who's excited to ever work with like pediatric patients? Got several. It's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. I never saw myself as working with peds uh, specifically. However, when you need a job, sometimes we'll take whatever you can get. <laughs> And through that, bore a love of pediatrics. So that's you know what I do a lot of times. You know, on Mondays uh, that's where I'm at at the Children's Hospital. You know, so I deal with these patients quite frequently. Um, they're a pretty cool set of people because usually, like the, the their medical problems is usually not their fault. You know, I can't be like stop smoking, you six year old. Like it's usually not their issue, right? Uh, so you can't really get mad at them. And then when you fix them, like they you know they kind of go back to like a normal kid in a lot of cases, which is pretty cool. You know, you can you can have some very sick kids and turn them around. That's what uh, some of the more fun things I like to see. Uh, this one when, when dealing with these pa uh, patients, but let's look at why they're different and what is uh, so kind of unique about them. Because um, you ever heard of like the term like you know oh just pediatrics is just like you know little adults, is that the case? No, they are physiologically quite different, and that is going to directly affect how their drugs are going to be working in them, as we'll see. Um, you know, especially from a kinetic standpoint, vastly different in many ways as well. <coughs> so anyway, so again, um, when I say you know it's a heterogeneous population, what do you think that means? They're not all the same, right? So, for instance, if I'm dealing with, like, say, an X 24 week uh, gestational age neonate, they are going to be very, very different than, say, dealing with, like, a 16 year old, right? They, and even if you go from, say, like, you know, premature infant uh, to, you know, say, a three year old, there are vast changes that occur there. And it's important to be cognizant of those changes as you go along, and which is why it's so important, especially when you're dealing with, like, uh, drug dosing or drug selection, you need to really make sure you're looking at pediatric specific information to make sure you're getting things correct, right? They're undergoing constant changes, and you'll also find, you know, when you're doing studies uh, for different drugs and things like that, you know, how ethical is it to, to do studies on, on kids compared to, like, say, like an adult patient? Like, can a kid consent to things like an adult can? No, oftentimes they don't have the wherewithal to really know, like, okay, you're going to give me this drug, and I'm going to be looking for these side effects. Like, they can't do that, right? Not to say there aren't studies done in kids, but the majority of information that we have is going to be taken from adults and extrapolated back. So, again, we said that you don't treat them like little adults, but sometimes that's all the information you have, essentially, right? So when we talk to uh, talk about, like, you know, protected classes of people, like, when doing studies, um, you know, pregnant patients, uh, prisoners, children are one of the big ones as well. So, um, we see that, you know, doing studies, it can be difficult there. But um, some of the lingo we'll cover here. Uh, so when I say gestational age, that's basically referring to their maturity at birth. Um, so you usually do it based off the last menstrual period uh, the, the, the mother had, and then also based on findings and you know, things like the physical exam and whatnot. But basically, um, you're going to say, like, how long was the child cooking, essentially, right? And so this is, becomes more important when you're looking at, like, the neonatal period. After that, it becomes less and less important as the patient gets older. Um, but this can drastically affect how we're going to be dosing drugs, as we'll see here in just a little bit. Um, postnatal age is just going to be their chronolo chronological age as you know, they, once they're born. And the postconceptional is just going to be a combination of the two. So anyone know what like, a normal gestation would be for a child? Like 38 to 40 weeks or so is considered being sort of a normal gestation period, as we'll see there. Um, Preterm would be really anything less than 37, typically. Um, and again, it's important to know, and actually one of the first things we'll do whenever we have um, you know, patients in the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit, where one of the first things I look at is to see what was their gestational age. You know, They may only be uh, a day old or a couple days old, a few weeks old, uh, but I always look back to see what their gestational age was to determine just how premature they were, right? So for instance, you know, if I have someone, uh, a kid who's born to say at 24 weeks, which is really one of the earliest uh, gestational ages that kids are still kind of physiologically they do they don't do great in a lot of cases sometimes they they stay in the NICU for months and months and months but let's say you have a 24 week uh, year old uh, 24 week gestational age patient compared to one that say was at 40 weeks um, and then you say they're both alive for a week straight you know does that premature baby catch up to that the other one in that time period? No, they don't. They still act like they're little fetuses that should be still cooking, essentially, still developing. And so because of that, you need to look at how premature they were to determine kind of how their kidneys are functioning, how's their GI tract functioning, all these different things. And so we'll look at some of those changes that occur there. Uh, full term, as I mentioned, you get 37 to 42 ish, somewhere around there. Um, uh, usually, most moms by that period, they said, just get this thing out of me. So, a lot of people, you know, will go ahead and just induce labor, you know, around 40 weeks or so. Uh, post term, be anything over 43. Uh, and then, when I talk about like a newborn or a neonate, that's just referring to that first uh, month of life. So, basically, the first 28 days of life, you're considered to be a newborn slash neonate, okay? Doesn't mean like we kick everyone out once they're, once they hit 29 days of age, we kick them out of the NICU. 
to the somewhere else in the hospital. We don't do that. We'll, sometimes we'll keep them in there for, for months at a time. Um, but uh, when I mentioned that's the first month, infant is just referring to the first year of life, essentially. Sometimes you'll hear people refer to infants when they're talking about a neonate. That's okay. It's probably fine. But again, when you're speaking about a newborn, uh, a neonate, that's really just that first month. And that's important too for certain like disease states. Uh, sometimes that'll change like that, uh, what type of antibiotics you're going to use, what type of drug selection you're going to make. So uh, it's important to keep in mind that that first month there is, is pretty critical. Toddler is going to be uh, more like the kind of the 12 to 24 month of age. Why do you call them toddlers? So I'm going to walk around, there's a toddler everywhere, right? Um, young children, usually like two to five. Um, again, I have a six-month-old right now, uh, and I have a two-year-old. So you can say I have a toddler, and then I also have an infant, right? So again, they're not a newborn at that point, so another six months old, but they're, they're definitely still uh, an infant. So I'm an infant and toddler. Uh, I can definitely tell you emotional uh, distress is highest at two, it seems like, uh, and only is getting worse. Uh, anyway, uh, you have young children, usually two to five, uh, older children, usually six to 12, you know, you kind of consider that, and then and usually adolescents, 13 to 17. Now, at a certain point, you're going to find they start kind of acting more and more like adults as they get older and more developed. So there's a certain period where, you know, especially with adolescents, when they're starting at like 16, 17, you kind of treat them a lot like adults, because at that point, they're pretty close to adult size anyway. And one of the big caveats you're going to see here is when you're looking at dosing um, for children is do you ever go above what the adult dose would be? based on like on weight or based on other things no generally you're going to cap things out at whatever the adult dose would be okay so for instance we'll look at different uh drug dosing paradigms but most things are drug uh dose based on their weight so say i'm going to give 10 milligrams per kilogram of drug if you're ever butting up against the adult dose that's where you're going to cap things out of. so that's a good caveat to remember when looking at uh, some of these cases here and things like that what we're going to look at later on Okay, so um, let's look at the, some of the differences in kinetics that are going to occur um, in an infant uh, during the, or especially in the neonatal period where the, the most rapid change is going to be occurring. That first month is a huge amount of change occurring. The first year as well is going to be a lot of change happening there. And then things will start to slow down a bit as they, as they tend to get older. But let's look at some of those changes. So absorption, we're going to find that we remember that, you know, different uh, features can modify how well a drug may get absorbed or not get absorbed, depending on changes in pKa, uh, depending on pH of the solution they're going in, right? We talked about things like uh, the size of the uh, the molecule trying to cross the membrane, all these different things, and, and dosage form can be very, very important for that. Um, so it's important to understand some of the changes that occur as that, uh, that infant starts to grow and uh, how absorption changes pretty drastically. So uh, looking at gastric absorption, right, because again, oral is going to be one of the most common ways you're going to be administering medications to these patients. One of the big things that happens with gastric absorption is that acidity is going to be pretty different depending on how old the child actually is. So for instance, if I have a kid who is zero days old, they're just born, um, do you think their stomach has really had time to really kind of kick up acid production? Probably not yet, right? It's going to start some acid production, and typically the, the more premature they are, the less likely they are to kind of kick that up. Um, but the other thing to think about is what have they been kind of swallowing all during that nine months of gestation? Amniotic yeah, amniotic fluid. Mom's producing a lot of amniotic fluid, and is that uh, particularly acidic or basic? Not really. It's kind of neutral, right? It's very similar to, you know, just like the plasma is neutral. Amniotic fluid tends to be a little more neutral. So they've been kind of swallowing that uh, to some degree for all, all that nine months, and so that means that the stomach is pretty much neutral at that point, right? And we mentioned that by changing the pH of the solution, that can modify how much a drug is ionized and how well it gets absorbed in those cases, right? So for instance, if I were to increase the pH of the stomach, what do you think that does to the absorption of weak acids? Would decrease it right because again remember light dissolves like so if i were to put a weak acid into a base a more basic solution you're going to find that is going to inhibit absorption right so that can be an issue you run into occasionally um the other thing you're going to find is gastric emptying time is going to be a big uh, determinant here as well right and that just refers to how quickly things are kind of moving through the gi tract so uh, looking at that pH uh, dependent passive diffusion, you mentioned that pH tends to be higher in those preterm infants. Um, gastric acid production also goes up with gestational age. So uh, a kid who comes out at 24 weeks or 28 weeks, they're going to be uh, producing a lot less acid compared to one that came out at 40 weeks, essentially, right? So again, that's why you always want to look back at the gestational age. Um, it's around six to eight for full-term infant for about one to three days or so, and that's mainly due to amniotic fluid. And then after that, you're going to find that they're going to start to produce really high amounts of acid content to try to get that pH back down, and then it'll start to kind of uh, um, you know kind of normalize itself out during that first month or so. And then they should be pretty close to a normal adult level by about three months as far as acid production goes. And remember that uh, the more basic uh, the, the stomach is, you're going to find that's going to be decreasing uh, acidic drug absorption. For basic drugs, you're going to find that you're actually going to have increased absorption, right? So you may get more drug being absorbed than what you would expect normally. All right, looking at the gastrointestinal uh, emptying time, again, this determines uh, the rate of absorption. So you normally find that kids less than six months of age can be uh, much slower in those cases. And so um, 
more often than not, there you're going to find that disease states will oftentimes modify how quickly the GI tract is going to be functioning. So, for instance, if I have a kid has a congenital heart disease, uh, and again, remember that the, the body wants to send blood two places, mainly heart and the head, right? So, again, if I have a bad heart and it's not pumping effectively or very efficiently, you're going to find some of these other organs are going to take a back seat. GI tract can be one of those. If I have kind of impaired blood flow going to the gut, that can also slow down that GIT as well, right? Kind of slow things down a little bit. Um, it's going to be affected by uh, the type of feeding that they're getting, whether they're getting like formula or breastfed, whatever it happens to be. And then also, again, looking at gestational versus uh, in the postnatal age as well. Typically, it's going to be increasing as time goes on. Okay. Um, usually, when you have shorter transit time, so things are moving through more quickly, you're going to find uh, that this means you have less time with absorptive surfaces, and that would actually decrease the total amount of absorption that can happen uh, for those kids. Um, you may find that if you were to use something like an extended release formulation that was designed to be uh, releasing over, say, a 12 hour or 24 hour period, you may find that it would be passing through so fast uh, that you know you don't have time to absorb all that drug. And it kind of makes sense when you think about like, the GI tracts of, of infants. If anyone's dealt with an infant recently, uh, how often do they poop? It seems like every five minutes, doesn't it? Like, it just, as soon as you change a diaper, all of a sudden it's like they smile at you and then you know it's it already came again. <laughs> Versus, like, as they get a little older, like my toddler, maybe one time a day, maybe twice a day, a bad day is no poops, and then she gets very cranky. But again, never under, undervalue the, the uh, you know, the, the, how much uh, a good poop can increase the quality of life. But anyway, <laughs> but you know, my infant, like, she has very frequent uh, bowel movements. So again, because she's an infant, that has a very quick gastrointestinal time, uh, transit time. That's going to mean that she may absorb drugs less than say something like a toddler who has a, a little bit more close to like an adult sort of level here. And again, my girls are going to be very traumatized by all the stuff that I've told you uh, students over the years. So just don't, don't repeat this, right? Just don't show them where the, my YouTube channel is. <laughs> anyway, so again, that's, that's why you can see some variability though between like different patient uh, levels of drugs is based on uh, the, the actual uh, uh, transit time, essentially. Okay, so looking at other uh, other than oral routes, so again, there's lots of, you know, in a lot of cases, you may find we, we will not use the oral route for these, especially young neonatal patients. We may use other things like parental administration, like either uh, intramuscular absorption, you may try to um, utilize uh, mucosal permeability, you may look at things like, you know, rectal administration, um, you may also look at skin permeability. So you're going to find that typically with neonates, muscular blood flow is going to be pretty much reduced for the most part. So what do you think this would do to like an intramuscular dose of a medication I were to give? So blood flow to the muscles decreased, and it's going to do to absorption from the muscle. It's going to decrease as well, right? Because you need blood flow going to the actual muscle to actually pick up that drug for it to be absorbed into the systemic circulation. It might actually be inhibited there, right? Um, versus like infants, when they start kind of moving around more and they're able to kind of control that blood flow a little bit better, there might be actual increase. By the time they're children, it should be pretty close to normal adult patterns. So IMs are a good way to give uh, medications for especially younger children. You know, we give a lot of vaccines via that route. That's really no problem. Um, other things we're going to look at, especially like skin permeability for, for infants, you imagine they have a very thick, well-developed stratum corneum, or is it pretty thin? They're going to find it's going to be pretty thin. These little kids are going to be, especially neonates, are going to be basically like kind of big bags of water, essentially, and very thin-skinned as well. So things have a very easy time to be absorbed, as it will turn out. I'll show you an example of that a little bit later. Um, I'm sorry, for mucosal permeability and skin permeability, it's going to be increased for, for both of these, in these cases here. Um, so we'll go into some specific examples where we might use something other than the oral route of administration. So again, intramuscular is going to be dependent on, on several factors. So again, it can depend on blood perfusion to the area of injection, areas that are not being perfused very well. And again, we know the muscular contractions help the blood flow to increase to those areas. If it's not happening very well, you're not going to really get a uh, good steady absorption. It's going to be a little bit more erratic in those cases. Um, and also, you have to look at the kind of the apparent volume into which the drug is being distributed. We'll find that the body water for infants tends to be very, very high compared to, say, like an older patient. And so that can affect volume distribution, as we'll see with things like hydrophilic drugs, uh, quite, quite specifically. But with neonates uh, and infants, so again, that first year of life, essentially, they're going to have decreased blood flow to the muscles. They're going to have an increased percent of body water. So it's going to increase that apparent volume for more like hydrophilic medications. And then you're also going to decrease uh, muscular contraction. So that means, again, less blood flow going to the muscles, less absorption, less, at least less quickly, I should say. Um, the other thing you're going to run into, they also have some peripheral vasomotor instability. Anyone know what that means? can't really control how well they're going to be dissipating heat or trying to contain heat with the vasodilation. Because remember we said, you know, when you have a lot of vasodilation to the skin, that helps to release off heat. That's why you sweat and things like that. Uh, they can't regulate their temperature very well, so that can also inhibit uh, how well the, the blood flow is going to be maintained to the muscles there. So that's another thing. That's why you usually have like a, uh, an infant, what do you normally kind of put them in to help maintain their temperature? 
they would probably put them on a blanket. But I don't think like in the hospital standpoint, like sometimes you have to put them under a heater, essentially. Like you have almost like an incubator kind of situation, try to maintain that heat there. Um, but that's why, you know, you usually want to kind of wrap them up, swaddle them up, because they, they, they get cold, essentially, very, very easily. So um, looking at rectal administration or like rectal absorption, this is actually very good. Uh, they have very good blood flow to the rectum, and so they have very good absorption. This is why we use uh, suppositories for these uh, little guys very frequently, especially like Tylenol suppositories, probably one of the more common things we'll use for pain or for, for fever um, because they have really good trans, uh, location of the mucosa. Uh, remember, when we go through rectal administration, does that bypass first pass or not? Yes, that does, right? So again, even better bioavailability than you would say for like an orally administered bed there. Okay. The other problem you have to think about though, as we mentioned, the GI tract is going to be working pretty quickly very early on. So they have an increased amplitude of rectal contractions. What do you think that might do to your drug? Push it out, right? So again, if they poop it out before they had time to absorb it, they're not going to absorb that drug at that point. Okay. So that's always the one thing to consider, you know, because uh, we'll have cases where a nurse will go to give them medication. They poop it out almost immediately and they have to give an additional dose to make sure they actually get what they're, they're supposed to in those cases there. Now, uh, intraosseous absorption is a really good thing we'll use uh, for kids because, again, when you think about the veins of a child versus an adult, how do you think they compare? Bigger or smaller? Smaller. It's smaller, right? So, again, um, and, and that means the IVs can be very difficult to get, especially if you're dealing with, like, an emergent situation where you need an IV, like, very, very quickly. So one thing we can actually do to get around that is actually use an intraosseous um, uh, route in order to actually uh, drill down directly into the marrow, essentially, in order to get this big kind of non-compressible vein. So it's a very good, quick way to get access uh, to these patients in, in order to give fluids. We can give medications, whatever we need to do, anything that we would give an IV, we can give through the IO, essentially. So it's nice because also their bones are not uh, completely ossified like an adult's might be, and so they're easy to get through uh, as well. Very good for emergency situations. Oftentimes, if you have kids where EMS has picked them up and say, for instance, they uh, there's like a near drowning or something, they pick them up out of the uh, retention pond or a pool or something like that, they're, they're pulseless, they're doing CPR, chances are they also have IOs placed because, again, they didn't have time uh, or the ability to get IVs placed. They'll have IOs, and that way you can run all your medications through that. So it's a very common thing you'll see in uh, emergency medicine with, with kids. Okay, when I say percutaneous absorption, what does that mean? Yeah, through the skin, right? So again, you're going to find that kids are going, to, are going to be very thin skin for the most part. They have an underdeveloped stratum corneum, which means things absorb more easily. Also, because they are very well hydrated, there's a lot of body water that can also increase absorption of things as well. Um, this can be a bad thing. You can find that it can actually lead to toxicity in some cases. Uh, there's actually one kind of interesting case. I tell you about the the kids who are showing positive for THC uh, in the hospital. Basically. There's a case where um, these uh, moms were basically uh, giving birth to these children, and I guess for some at-risk uh, patients, they would actually go and they would do a urine drug screen on the child. Because again, when moms are being exposed to drugs, that can, can transfer over to the child. So if I were to say, um, if mom was supposed to was smoking marijuana during the pregnancy, and then you could test the urine of the child and see THC was, was present there, right? And so that may have legal ramifications, may have to get things like you know Department of Children and Families involved. Anyway, there's this hospital there. Basically, they, they found these babies that were positive for THC. And uh, the moms are like, I've never smoked marijuana in my life. Like, there's, there's no way this kid is actually positive there. So I said, well, okay, let's figure out what's going on. So they tested the moms. Sure enough, moms are negative. And they're like, well, what the heck is going on? How these, these kids aren't, like, lighting up in the middle of the NICU? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? But they actually found that there's a moisturizer they had been using uh, on these infants that actually, I think it was like an Aveeno brand uh, of some kind of moisturizer they're using on the babies. And actually, because their skin was so thin, it was able to absorb some of the compounds that were in there. And one of them actually looked close enough to THC that actually tripped the assay. And so the baby showed positive, even though the moms were negative, right? Because they had very good absorption through there. So again, you got to be careful with this, um, you know, especially if you're applying it to any areas where you're going to be occluding with like a diaper or something, because usually occlusive dressings uh, are going to increase absorption in those cases. And I mentioned that one case where that one little baby... Um, um, got dad's, uh, uh, you know, pain cream essentially, right? And the kid was found apneic later on and took him and they could actually measure the levels of some of those drugs in his system because it was something that got absorbed very easily through that, that infant's uh, skin, right? So again, kids uh, are, are very uh, you know, sensitive to that sort of thing, very easy to absorb. And actually, there's been some other cases where, for instance, if I was using something like an antihistamine lotion, like a Benadryl sort of lotion, kids have de uh, developed seizures from toxicity to that. Uh, and then in the cases where um, isopropanol, anyone know another name for that? Yeah, rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol. They used to use that to clean the babies in some cases and actually found that, that isopropyl could be absorbed and very similar to how alcohol would also affect kids this way. It actually caused hypoglycemia, lethargy. So again, certain things we don't use in infants because of the fact that they can absorb it so easily, right? 
Okay. So then looking at our volume distribution, remember our, our equation that we use where C0 equals dose over VD. We can rearrange that so that VD equals dose over C0. And remember that the volume distribution is going to be pretty altered for uh, small children, especially in the unit, versus, uh, say, an adult patient, right? Because I mentioned that their volume of distribution for hydrophilic medications will be much higher because their body content of water is much higher uh, in those cases. So I'm going to show you uh, these distribution sites uh, in a little more detail in just a second here. So yeah, that was absorption. Now distribution, again, is going to be affected by things like lipid solubility. Protein binding is also going to affect this. Remember how protein binding had an effect? So that increased protein binding, what does that do to the volume distribution? It should lower it, right? Because I'm actually holding on to more drug in the systemic circulation, right? So again, that would actually lead to a lower volume distribution. We'll find protein stores are going to be different in kids than some of the older patients. Um, tissue binding, if you had a lot of tissue binding, what would that do to the volume distribution? That would increase it, right? Because more drugs being bound up by the tissue peripherally. Uh, and then we'll also uh, look at the kind of the peripheral tissue distribution as well. So, um, and also just remember critically uh, different disease states can affect this as well. If you have like a lot of fluid on board, if you don't, you have, uh, you have trauma, burn victims, edema, all those sort of things can affect this as well. So a lot of disease states that may be playing a role here additionally. So looking at a newborn infant, as I mentioned, they're kind of a big bag of water, about 70 to 75% uh, their body weight is going to be made up of water. And so you find they also have a higher uh, extracellular water component as well. And actually, one of the big things you're going to find that when kids are first born is they actually tend to drop weight initially because a lot of that is uh, fluid from mom. Basically, they're going to be diuresing off initially. So again, so typically, if you're looking at weights for patients, uh, neonatal patients, you'll see they'll dip down a little bit, and then they should start to pick back up as they're eating and growing uh, in those cases. They also tend to have a less uh, fat tissue associated with them. So that would cause lipophilic medications to have a smaller or larger volume distribution. That case would be smaller, right? Because again, more of it's going to be more uh, partitioned into the central circulation because it's not they don't have any fat tissue for it to, to distribute to. Less muscle mm -hmm. tissue as well. So in general, higher volume distribution for hydrophilic meds. Okay, that's going to be important. I'll show you some clinical examples of how we modify our dosing to account for this to make sure that our serum levels stay roughly the same. Basically, you can think of kids having a bigger bucket than an adult patient might, right? So their volume distribution for hydrophilic meds much larger uh, than, um, you know, say, for an adult patient. Okay. Again, don't recommend putting kids into buckets. Cardboard box is kind of fun uh, sometimes, uh, but just be careful. Those things tip over very easily. Basically, what this means, though, is that based on that volume distribution equaling that C0 over our dose, it basically means I need to give a bigger dose, a bigger milligram per kilogram dose, in order to fill the same bucket as I would for, uh, for an adult patient. Okay, So we're going to see some clinical examples of that in just a second here. <clears throat> So here's an example of gentamicin. This is an aminoglycoside antibiotic. We'll talk much more about this in Farm 1 coming up next semester. However, this is a very common uh, uh, antibiotic that we use for treating gram-negative infections. Okay, Just kind of start you thinking about things like gram-positive, gram-negative, all that sort of thing, bugs and drugs, right? So anyway, so looking at the patient age, whether we're dealing with a neonate, say uh, an older patient, an infant up to a child, uh, and then versus adolescents or adults, you notice here that the volume distribution on a liter per kilogram basis, right? So we take the patient's weight out of the equation here. You notice here it's 0.5 to 0.6, which is much higher than 0.2 to 0.3 for the adult patient, right? And remember, what do we say was like a small volume distribution as far as liters per kilogram? Yeah, less than one. Again, if you're ever guessing, one, one something per something is usually a pretty good guess in a lot of cases. But less than one liter per kilogram would be considered to be a small volume of distribution. So you know that gentamicin likes to stay there within the, the central circulation. You probably also know that's pretty hydrophilic in these cases, right? Lipophilic drugs tend to have a lot, lot larger volume of distribution. So basically, we know that these kids have a lot more body water to them. So that means that that drug is starting to partition out into the tissues. Okay, so in order to get the same serum concentration, which is a measure right there in the in the systemic circulation, I have to give you a much larger dose to account for that. So, for instance, with a neonate, I may have to give a four to five milligram per kilogram dose to get the same serum concentrations as I do for a patient who's only getting an adult patient getting one to two milligrams per kilogram. Okay, so because the volume distribution is larger for the neonates, I have to give a larger dose to get the same concentration. Make sense? And this is more dealing with the hydrophilic meds. Again, that when you're looking up your drug dosing, you're not necessarily thinking about this directly, but when you look at it, you see, like, okay, why is a kid getting a bigger dose on a weight, uh, you know, pound per pound basis versus an adult patient? These are some of the things that influence that, right? So when you're looking up your Hippocrates, mm -hmm. your micromatics, this is what is influencing those, those decisions there, okay? All right. Uh, as far as plasma proteins go, typically they're diminished uh, in kids until they start to kind of develop them through the, the, the infancy. Um, you're also going to find lower protein binding because of that, lower protein stores. And then in some cases, you may actually find that 
either certain endogenous uh, molecules that are going to be kind of competing for protein binding sites. There's going to be an important drug interaction we'll talk about where uh, if drugs are fighting for the same sites in the proteins, you can find one can kick the other one off and potentially the issues here. So for instance, like bilirubin, which we know bilirubin is, is what basically? Where does it come from? It comes from the liver, right? It's important for things like, uh, especially with helping and producing like cholesterol and things like that. But bilirubin, some of these byproducts here, and we're going to find that bilirubin likes to bind up to something like albumin, right? So binding to albumin. If I have a drug that comes along and kicks that off, and, my albumin, and then my bilirubin levels start to, to increase, anyone know what that can cause in, in these patients? Cause jaundice, which is what? Yeah, basically yellowing of the skin. So you can have these cases where if I had a drug that was competing for the same binding sites, all of a sudden uh, the patient's uh, free level of bilirubin will start to climb up pretty significantly and they get this neonatal jaundice. For, so for instance, there's a drug called ceftriaxone or rocephin. Anyone ever heard of rocephin? It's a very common IV antibiotic here. And you get, you'll hear a lot about rocephin. You use it for lots of different things, STDs and uh, pneumonias and UTIs and all kinds of different things. Rocephin gets a lot of use in the hospital. But for the first 30 days of life, we cannot give rocephin to those patients because it will kick that bilirubin off the proteins, and then all of a sudden they have this neonatal jaundice, right? So the first 28 days, you can't use that. You got to switch over and use a, a different drug within that same class, okay? So again, this can directly affect what drugs you use for these patients, okay? Um, other examples, uh, a drug called phenytoin, which is one we use for seizures. Uh, basically, it is very highly protein-bound. However, if we have a patient who is lower in those albumin stores, like a neonate, you may find they actually have a higher free fraction. We mentioned that things that are unbound to proteins or free are able to have their physiologic effect, right? So again, even if they have the same level as a patient who's older, you uh, may find they may be experiencing more toxic effects from this because they have a higher free fraction, essentially. Make sense? Okay. And again, you can see how di some different proteins are going to be either present, reduced, or, or near adult levels. You can see some of these will normalize out pretty quickly. May only be dealing with this, say, for the first month of life or so. Um, some of these are going to be uh, dealing with for you know a longer period of time. Just depends on the proteins. I'm not going to ask you specifically here which ones, um, you know, which ones are reduced or present or whatever in, in, in an infant. However, I might ask if I change this level of this protein, if I say decrease the levels, what effect might they have on this type of drug? Okay, those are things I might ask more conceptual sort of questions. Okay. Next up, we're looking at metabolism. So what are some things that can affect metabolism? Um, we'll see that gestational age and postnatal age are going to have dramatic effects on metabolism. The more premature they are, the less able they are to metabolize certain things. You're going to find that changes in hepatic blood flow will affect this. So if I increase hepatic blood flow, what does that do to metabolism? Should increase, right? More blood making it to the uh, to liver, more of it able to be uh, metabolized. Size of the liver is going to be important here. The number and quantity of the actual uh, quality of the enzyme to have available. And then certain things like disease states. And then we'll talk about enzyme induction and inhibition. So uh, remember phase one reactions? That is doing what essentially? We're trying to make the, the molecule more polar to make it more readily available to be excreted by the kidneys, right? In some cases, phase one reactions that are going to lead into a phase two reaction. In a phase two reactions, what happens? This is where we add something onto the molecule, like a methyl group or a hydroxyl group, whatever it happened, and then that can then be excreted through the kidneys, right? So you can go back and review that stuff, uh, you know, definitely before the test. These are good concepts to know. Um, but basically, when you have a phase one reaction, remember the most important one we talked about was oxidation, because which enzymes cause this oxidation in the liver? Most important enzymes I told you to remember for drug metabolism: cytochrome P450, right? Cytochrome P450, it's going to be super important. It's an oxidative enzyme system. Um, we're going to find that uh, infants and, and neonates, they may not be expressing all the same enzymes we do as an adult. Um, it takes time for those to develop and to mature, as we'll see. So we're going to find that, um, you know, the activity here in full-term infants is may only half of that of the adults, right? So that may influence how much of a drug you give or how often you're going to give it based on the fact that you're going to have a much... Uh, less ability to actually uh, metabolize those drugs. They just don't have the number, same number of enzymes. So for example, we can see that uh, for a drug uh, called phenytoin, as I mentioned, used for seizures, by one year of age, you can actually find that in some cases, kids actually ramp up production and they actually have more enzymes than an adult might. So in some you know, very early cases, it might be lower. Sometimes it might be higher as they develop. But we can actually find here that um, by one year of age, they're actually able to metabolize phenytoin two to five times greater than an adult mm -hmm. patient might. So if I'm metabolizing it faster, what do you think I need to do to my dose? need to increase. I need to give them a bigger dose now because they're metabolizing so quickly they can't keep their levels up, right? So that could be one thing you might find where they actually can modify how big of a dose you're going to be administering based on the age of the patient. I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, other things, you know, things like hydrolysis, you know, if you had something like procaine or tetracaine, these are types of uh, local anesthetics, just like numb tissue, uh, you may find that, you know, if they don't have enough of a plasma esterase, it's available. Maybe they don't metabolize as quickly. Maybe they can develop toxicity from that. 
And then you know, things like theophylline is an old school drug we use for asthma, but it sometimes can prolong the half-life. I'm not going to ask you these specific examples, but you can conceptually kind of know what's going on here. If I say, hey, listen, these patients have an upregulated enzyme system when they're one year of age, what does that do to my dose? Do I need to increase it, decrease it, leave it the same? Those are kind of things you want to kind of key in on. Remember, um, so for uh, just an example, something like, you know, CYP2E1 um, increases pretty rapidly just within the first couple hours after birth. It kind of helps to stimulate production of those enzymes. Um, things like 2D6 uh, detectable soon after that. And remember the most important one we talked about? 3A4 is going to be the most important one. You're going to find you know, within the first month, that's when they start to express that 3A4, right? So even before that, you may find they're not able to metabolize drugs to undergo that system very well. But then by a month, maybe they're fine at that point, okay? Okay, and I mentioned phase two reactions. Again, this is just where we're adding on some sort of functional group to the molecule to usually make it uh, more, more polar, more able to be excreted by the kidneys or the bile potentially. Um, some things like sulfation, methylation. You know, sulfation would just be what? Adding sulfate group, right? Again, pretty straightforward. Methylation just add methyl group, yeah, all those things. Yeah, I may add a glucuronide or glycine uh, to, the, to the molecule. So again, these are just different pathways, just like we have hydrolysis and oxidation, but these are all phase two reactions. So um, let's look at an example for instance, like a uh, specific pathways, so, like sulfation is actually really, really well developed um, at birth. And so uh, this is a, a, an important pathway for acetaminophen. I mentioned acetaminophen, otherwise known as Tylenol. Remember, uh, if we give too much Tylenol, it's the main organ that it takes a hit. Liver. The liver, right? Liver, liver damage is the big thing you worry about. I can actually give a bigger milligram per kilogram dose of Tylenol to a child, and I can to an adult patient, they don't experience toxicity until much higher levels than the adult patient would because their sulfation pathway is much better expressed. So for instance, when I'm at the poison center and someone calls in and say, hey, I took this much Tylenol, first thing I ask them, how, how old is the patient? And then if they say there's a kid, then I can say, okay, well, I know that they can tolerate up to 200 milligrams per kilogram before it's a problem. An adult only can handle it maybe up to 150. Okay, so that's something that actually will influence whether or not I send them into the hospital for further care or not uh, based on, on their age, right, and how well they can metabolize some of these things. Um, just some other examples, you know, things like uh, morphine, uh, you know, maybe underdeveloped, but by the time the three years of age, maybe it'll be a little bit more mature, more able to metabolize that. So doses, you know, if it's underdeveloped at birth, what do you think I would do to the dose I'd give? They're not metabolizing as well. I'd probably decrease the dose. I'd give a smaller dose to account for the fact they cannot metabolize it as well. And then as they get older, I may find it'll switch over and I'll have to readjust my dose uh, at that, maybe that three-year mark, for instance. Um, Here's an example. We used to, um, whenever you're dealing with like NICU patients, you always want to make sure that you use uh, drugs that are preservative free. The reason for that is, and again, preservatives do what for our drugs? Yeah, they make them last for long. They keep them more stable, right? They keep bugs uh, from growing in them. They keep them uh, stable for longer, right? Uh, just like preservatives and, and anything else. We can't use certain preservatives for the neonates because uh, they may not be able to metabolize them. So even though the drug may be okay for them to get, there's something else in the product that is not. So for instance, there's one called benzyl alcohol um, that we used to use, but the patients could not uh, do a glycine conjugation very well. And so it led to this gasping syndrome. They got severe metabolic acidosis, and, they, and there's some kids that died from that. So that's why we only use certain formulations that do not contain preservatives for those neonates patients. They just can't handle it from a uh, metabolism standpoint. Okay, and then excretion. This is probably one of the more um, important ones uh, to look at. So renal function in kids is going to be wildly different depending on uh, what their gestational age was, uh, how well developed they are. Um, and so again, looking at uh, renal excretion, we know that uh, things like how well the glomeruli are working, how many of them there are, how well developed they are, can severely affect you know how well we're able to excrete drugs. Um, you're looking at things like protein binding of the drugs. More protein binding means it's less likely to be filtered out and go into the kidneys. That could be one thing that can affect it. Uh, renal blood flow disease states, if we're using nephrotoxic meds, which means we're damaging the kidneys with our drugs we're giving, and then we'll also look at things like, you know, urine pH and whatnot. So um, GFR, glomerular filtration rate, and remember how we calculated that for adults, what we talked about? So we, we use our serum creatinine, we plug that into, the, remember that equation I talked about? A cockroft galt equation, that's probably going to be the one of the more common ones you're going to use in, in clinical practice, or when you see a creatinine clearance being, um, you know, because like in our system, like we use, we use EPIC over at um, Nemours, that's our, our um, electronic medical record system. Uh, when you put in the patient's information, or they get a creatinine drawn, it automatically just populates a creatinine clearance, right? So in a children's hospital, you're going to find you use different equations, right? Because again, the studies are different to determine what that is in an adult, but for adult patients, it's usually cockroft galt. But one of the things you'll note uh, for uh, especially infants is that during that first week of life, the serum creatinine is actually elevated above what they would naturally be producing. Because again, remember, uh, remember that creatinine comes from where? Yeah, from yeah from the muscle essentially, right? And we mentioned that kids usually have what about muscle? Less or more than adult? 
usually less, right? So, okay, well, why do they have an increased creatinine even though they have less muscle mass? Why, why, why would that be? Hmm? Uh, not that they're building more muscle. Who's, uh, where are they getting the majority of their blood flow from before they were born? From mom. So you're actually measuring mom's serum creatinine for that first week or so, right? As the patient has time to actually filter out that serum creatinine and get rid of it and metabolize it, um, you actually find it'll drop back down to where it should be for those kids. So, you know, if you see a kid first couple of days of life and their creatinine is like one, normally that would be cause for concern if they're a little bit older. But I know that first couple of days, then that's not going to be a problem. I know it's going to go down on their own, assuming the kidneys are functioning. But that first two weeks, you're going to see pretty rapid uh, in development, increase in GFR, better filtration uh, occurring there. However, the more preterm they are, the more premature they are, you're going to find they're going to have a uh, much harder time because the number and, and quality of the nephrons they have are going to be uh, diminished. Um, you know, the proximal tubules we're going to find, especially in physio, when we talk about that, they're not going to be able to filter and reabsorb things appropriately, and, and they may find uh, reduced renal blood flow in total. And again, if I can't get drugs to the kidney to filter them, then they never get filtered, essentially. And so you look here, just looking at the fact that if you're looking at, say, like a preterm uh, infant, uh, and again, usually you're going to base them uh, off of their weight. So, for instance, you know, less than uh, you know, 1,500 grams versus 2,000 grams. So again, these are kind of different differentiations here. Usually the more preterm ones are going to be lesser of weight. Um, again, notice these are grams we're dealing with, not kilograms. So, again, it's very small um, uh, little peanuts here. But looking at their actual renal function, if you look at GFR, you notice where the term ones maybe starting out at 30 for the first couple of days, and it's going to gradually increase here. What do you kind of notice that even at, at two weeks out, what do you notice about the preterm one versus, you know, even the, the term infant when they were first born? They're still playing catch up. They haven't even achieved, you know, what a newborn's, uh, you know, term infant's normal creatinine clearance would be um, even at two weeks out. So, again, because that would have been time, they probably still would have been in mom developing, right? So, again, they take time to really catch up there. That's why you can see these stays in the NICU for so long because they're just developing still because they should have had another month or two months potentially to, to cook essentially. Okay, so again, looking at GFR, you can see that what the normal values are going to be. You can see that by the time you know they're six months older, so they sh should be pretty close to to adult levels uh, at that point, right? And again, we're going to use different equations here. I'm not going to get into that specifically. Just know that you want to make sure you're using uh, pediatric specific equations. And we said GFR is pretty good, but what are other ways could I monitor for renal function? So look at urine output. Urine output's a really good way to actually be able to uh, measure how much actual filtration and, and elimination they're actually having there. So that's one thing we'll actually monitor. And again, we can weigh things either they have like an indwelling catheter, we can collect the urine directly, or we can do things like weigh their diapers uh, and determine uh, how much uh, outputs they're having essentially. And so usually what we're looking at, we'll look at it uh, in terms of mLs per kilo per hour, essentially how much they're producing. And as long as you're you know above one, one mL per kilo per hour, that's usually pretty good urine output for an infant. Um, young children will use that number pretty frequently there. So uh, going back to the renal function, we saw that neonates are obviously going to have lesser GFR than an older patient. Uh, we're going to see the example of gentamicin again. We mentioned it's pretty uh, hydrophilic, so it likes to be um, you know, in the bloodstream, has a low volume distribution. It also probably means it has pretty good urine uh, elimination, you know, uh, renal elimination there. So if you look at how long the half-life is, which we said half-life is what? Um, it takes for half the drug to, to be metabolized or to be eliminated. You notice here the half-life is a whole lot longer for a neonate, say less than a week old, versus say, an adult patient. You know, maybe three to 11 and a half hours versus say one and a half to three. So what do you think that does to your dosing? So you could maybe decrease it. What's the other thing I can change? So remember, I can change two things. I can change the dose I give and I can also change what? That the interval, how often I'm going to give it. So in this case, say I want to keep the dose the same, because we mentioned just to get the same serum concentration as an adult patient for this drug, I had to give a bigger dose on a milligram per kilogram basis, right? I had to give, say, you know, four to five milligrams versus, say, one uh, for an adult patient. So if I'm already giving a bigger dose, then I can maybe do what instead? Give it more or less frequently? Give it less frequently. So in these cases, especially depending on how premature they are, I might give this drug, say, like an adult patient, I give it every eight hours. This one I may only give every 24 I may give every 36, I may give every 48 hours, depending on just how premature they are and how well their kidneys are functioning, okay? So again, the interval is really important and the dose you're gonna be administering is really important. And that's why you look this stuff up whenever you're dealing with these patients, because again, they, are, they can be very sensitive. Small changes in dose or frequency can have dramatic effects here, okay? All right, 
So again, uh, absorption and secretion that occurs in the kidneys is going to be pretty uh, diminished for the first year of life or so. Um, and also, you need to look at things like you know, renal blood flow. This is also going to help to make sure we're actually getting products to the kidneys to actually eliminate there. Um, you may also have issues where they may not be able to concentrate uh, the, the urine appropriately. They may have uh, lower urinary pH values. All that can affect elimination. Okay. So again, when you're looking at this drug dosing, uh, they've already taken this into account. You're uh, trying to value how often I'm giving a drug, how much I'm actually giving. Okay. So there's uh, some other cases here. We can have diversity in drug responses. We can find that lots of different factors are going to come in to say, like, well, how do, how do these kids actually respond to uh, these medications here? So we're going to look at things like genetics, look at other biological factors, environmental factors as we go forward here. So again, I mentioned that example of that codeine metabolism. Remember, I said that some people are really rapid metabolizers of uh, 2D6, uh, and, and they can convert a lot of that morphine or that codeine over to morphine. Remember that example I talked about previously? No? I'll briefly go over here again. Um, so remember that some people of different ethnic backgrounds can express different levels of this CYP2D6 enzyme. Some people express a lot of it. Some people express a little bit of it. If you express a lot of it, you're very able to convert things like codeine over to morphine. And so we're actually having these kids who were having um, these exaggerated responses, especially after they were coming out of surgery. They had obstructive sleep apnea. So we were coming in, taking out the tonsils, uh, and they you know, had a big swollen airway afterwards, and they were converting all this codeine and morphine. And then one of the big side effects there are those drugs is respiratory depression. So you just find these kids dying. So because of that, got a big black box warning, right? So again, usually if you have drugs that have a really significant side effect, they'll put a big black, black box on the uh, top of the drug information and uh, warning you about that. And then, like I mentioned, we stopped using it all together over no more. So we don't even use codeine uh, at all. So um, looking at the different uh, dosing regimens we might use for a patient, um, you know, there's already kind of alluded to kind of weight-based dosing. Here's some other varieties we can uh, look at here. So here's an example of like an age-based dosing regimen. Like, uh, nowadays, we probably wouldn't use codeine too frequently, but it used to get uh, be a very popular drug uh, for pediatrics. And so if you look here, you notice here that, okay, for maybe like for a two to five-year-old, I'm going to go ahead and use, say, two and a half to five milligrams versus uh, as they get older. And so what do you think are some drawbacks of using um, an age-based sort of dosing regimen? No, it really does. Yeah, I can assume that a six-year-old is bigger than a two-year-old, right? But by how much? Like, and, and depending on their disease states, you can have very large children. You can have very small children, right? Um, you know, pediatric obesity is a huge, huge topic, and it's becoming much more prevalent nowadays. And so, again, you don't take weight into account. So it's very easy. You could be potentially underdosing a kid who's a lot heavier than what their maybe their cohort would be at their age. You may find that you're overdosing kids who are a lot smaller than what their normal cohort would be, right? So easy to use in practice, so very easy to, to remember some of these, uh, these dosing breakdowns, but it assumes that everyone is the same as far from a pharmacokinetic sort of standpoint, and that's not always going to be the case. You can sometimes get into trouble. So age-based dosing is okay, not done super frequently, okay? The more, much more common thing we're going to do here is going to be body weight dosing regimens. And so, for instance, you know, say for neonates or infants, we're going to say 20 to 30 milligrams per kilogram per day, uh, PO, which means... By mouth, yeah, divided every 12 hours, right? Versus if we're dealing with older kids, say greater than three months, we're going to do, say, 25 to 50. This is at least taking into account the different physiology between, say, like a neonate to an infant to an adult. Um, it's a very common way that we're going to do this. However, you may find that... Um, you know, some kids may have differences in like a med clearance depending on on their body weight. You may find that um, you know there there are a little bit of drawbacks to this, but by the fact that we're taking into account the patient's weight, you really limit your ability to overdose or underdose like you would with like a strictly age-based sort of dosing regimen. Okay. We'll go over some examples of uh, how to do this in a little bit. Um, and again, we know the, the incidence of uh, overweight children is definitely going up. So again, uh, as they get bigger, you know, you may be hitting these adult doses a lot sooner for these kids, uh, depending on how big they are. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're kind of adjusting for that appropriately. Because again, um, when these kids get bigger, their adipose tissue is uh, expanding, you know. Uh, and so you have to look at things like volume distribution, et cetera. So again, be careful with these uh, a lot bigger kids there. Okay. Uh, another way you could do it is with body surface area. And so this is basically uh, taking into account um, the patient's height and their weight together. So this is oftentimes done uh, for things like chemotherapy. Uh, when we're do dosing chemotherapy drugs for our patients with cancer, uh, we're using body surface area. This takes into account their weight and also their height. Okay, so that way if you have like a particularly long kid or short kid, you can find that um, that will have, uh, you're taking that factor out of its effect on, on their, their weight essentially, right? Um, 
And so, for instance, you might use like a drug like corticotropin, 150 milligrams per meter squared intramuscularly. There's several different calculations for how to do that, but just know that um, you, you'll become familiar if you're working with this, these populations, kind of what you're using most frequently. This is very, very precise. Um, however, it's a little bit more labor intensive to get those values there, and but it does uh, limit the potential for overdose, which, which is good. And so, less commonly used than the weight base, but still used uh, depending on the clinical situation there. Okay. All right, any questions from the first half? All right, so we're going to finish up this section and then move on to the next one. You guys have a study period after this. I figure that's free time, so I'm just going to go to 4.30 to catch up. Yes. Just kidding, I'm not going to do that. I do not want to lead a revolt, or incite a revolt, I should say. Anywho. Just kidding, I'm not doing that. All right. So let's go, uh, we're talking about uh, drug administration for, for these pediatric patients. Remember IV uh, drug administration can be somewhat problematic, right? So it's, it's a good easy way to get 100% bioavailability for our patients, but there's some, some issues, right? So for instance, you know, can you get actually IV access? You know, in those cases we mentioned, you can use IO as an alternative, one way to do it. Um, you also look at things like the volume of drug that we're administering, right? So how much actual fluid are we administering? Why can that be a problem in, in pediatrics? So imagine giving 5 mLs of a drug to an adult patient versus 5 mLs to a neonate. That's a whole lot more volume to that child because they're a lot smaller, right? So again, you can actually find, you can cause big shifts based on how much fluid you're giving um, in these drugs where you can actually change their hematocrit. rate. Um, you can change their um, their sodium levels. You can change all sorts of things. You have to be really careful with that. Usually we like to shoot for things that are more concentrated. However, we know that, that can cause problems out in the periphery. Sometimes you need central access. So it just depends on the drug and, and on the patient. Typically, we'd use more concentrated drugs so that way we're giving less of volume. It's always an, always an important thing to consider. Um, but we also have to look at things like multiple drugs at the same time. And we mentioned that some drugs have incompatibilities. How many lines do you actually have? You know, in some cases, it's lucky if you have two lines for a kid, and sometimes you only have the one to deal with. So that can be an issue, uh, issue there. Um, also, imagine like you know getting an IV started on a kid. Um, you know, that's a pretty traumatic process for a lot of them, a lot of them have needle phobia. So it's a matter of even getting the kid to sit still to actually comply with you actually doing the, the needle stick in the first place. I mean, uh, tough. And then uh, we'll talk about therapeutic drug monitoring more extensively in the next section coming up. But again, what, what is that? Or I'm drawing blood levels to actually determine the, the concentration of the, of the drug in the patient, essentially. And actually, that can be problematic. If you have to do a lot of blood draws on these patients, especially these little neonates or premature, you can actually, again, very dramatically affect their hematocrit and hemoglobin if you're taking too much blood off of them. So sometimes you have to make sure you're using the smallest amount of blood possible. Sometimes trying to time things, you can use this, um, get more labs off of one draw than having to do it at disparate times. Um, so those are all important considerations when you're thinking about IV access for these kids. Now again, do I just want to hang a drug and just let it run to gravity? No, you need to make sure that you need actually giving the exact proper amount. Again, with adults, you know, um, I can give a liter of fluids. It's probably not going to be a big deal for them. But with kids, you have to make sure you're using a very specific amount uh, of volume for them. You want to make sure you're calculating these doses appropriately because otherwise you can give them too much, too little, it can lead to problems. There's been issues where uh, a neonate had uh, a whole liter of saline. They just hung it and didn't uh, run a pump on it and just let it run to gravity. The whole liter got into that kid. And that was just way too much volume. And again, where does fluid like to back up uh, potentially? You have too much volume on board, perture in the peripheral where, where more importantly, maybe where we exchange oxygen. The lungs, yeah, so they can develop flash pulmonary edema and that could prevent oxygenation and kill somebody, right? So it's very important that we make sure we're administering very exact amounts of drug to these patients, which is where we can do things like having an actual pump uh, that will, uh, that can be programmed to actually in, in, you know, instill the right amount uh, over the right amount of time, make sure we're using the right concentrations. This is one example of what that could look like. Here's an example of the type of pump that we use uh, for in, in running in, in medications into our patients. Notice here there's a syringe that will connect to here, and this, uh, this little apparatus here can actually determine the size of the syringe. So that way it'll know how fast to push that barrel in order to know, or that, how, the plunger, I should say, how fast to push it to make sure they're giving the right amount of drug over the right amount of time. And we have like libraries that we'll program into there to make sure that it's very safe for them, right? Um, so that way when you plug in a certain drug, it'll come up with certain parameters, and you can't give too much, too little, too fast, too slow. Um, so these are very, very important to get set up appropriately and you'll see these at a lot of pediatric uh, institutions for sure okay with oral administration how easy do you think it is to give kids oral medications especially like a two-year-old put it in peanut butter hmm? put it, oh. <laughs> you could try you can try but um 
You know, if I put like a whole tablet into a thing, I don't know, who knows, maybe it'll work. Works for my dog, maybe it'll work for my child. Um, I can tell you, after after having my own kid, I can tell you that I have a lot more respect for pediatric nurses who deal with these kids all the time, because most of the time when you try to give them some medication orally, where does it end up? Back on you, usually, right? Because they're going to spit it back out at you. Because, again, can little kids take tablets, capsules? Not not usually, right? Not until they get a little bit older. So you usually have to use liquid dosage forms, right? And so, again, uh, depending on the volume and depending on the taste of it, you're going to find that they have a varying level of successes here. The other thing to consider is is the measuring device, right? So, uh, for instance, you know, you say you take a, uh, some liquid medication. They normally measure it in, in what? Spoons, teaspoons, tablespoons. Anyone know how much volume a teaspoon is? For a teaspoon, it's actually 5 mLs. For a tablespoon, it's 15, okay? So imagine lay public, no medical knowledge. Like they, they probably don't know that off the top of their head. The other thing is, is like imagine all the different spoons you have probably in your in your drawer in the kitchen. Um, you know, I have some spoons from like Walmart, and I have some spoons that are from Ikea, and my Swedish spoons probably measure a little bit differently than the uh, the American spoons, right? And, uh, you know, all everything in between. So no, no two spoons are created equal, so to speak, and so the, those volumes can change quite drastically. So one teaspoon may not always be five mLs depending on the teaspoon. So how do we get around that? Use an oral syringe, just like we do for IV to get a very exact doses. We use IV, or I'm sorry, we use oral syringes that have the same kind of markings you would see on an IV syringe, right? So again, we don't put a needle on the end of it. That would hurt if you tried to give to a patient, but there's a blunt end on it, and the patient can use that. And that gives us the ability to get very exact measurements. And so every pharmacy where you send a pediatric prescription to, they should be able to provide those dosing syringes. That way they can actually drop the right amount. And in fact, um, if you guys have ever seen, like, uh, say, some like Benadryl, Tylenol liquid, you know how they come those little cups? Right. Actually, I, I, we were giving Benadryl to my, my child. Uh, she's having some a lot of stuffy nose and runny nose and all that. And so we were giving her some Benadryl. And so I took the cup and I was like, let me see how accurate this cup actually is. And so I did five mLs in, into the cup where the marking was, and then I drew it up with an oral syringe. And it was like six or seven mLs. And I was like, well, even this little cup here is not accurate. Like, what the heck? You know? And, and people are giving this dose to all kinds of kids. So dosing syringes are going to be always the most accurate thing you can do, and we always recommend using those for these kids here. Right. Um, I think consider like the sensory appeal of the the drug you're giving. You know, is it uh, a good texture or not? Um, you know, is it uh, can you put it into peanut butter? Maybe maybe that can affect the sensory appeal. A lot of times though, we can change the flavor of it. So if you go like to Walgreens or CVS, they'll have little machines where they can actually change the flavor of drugs. Um, I don't know about you guys. Like when I had drugs when I was a kid, um, they were all they all tasted terrible. Like, it was like the worst thing when you got sick. Nowadays everything's like orange flavored and grape flavored and like kids love these things. I'll have parents will call me at the poison center and say my kid drank an entire bottle of Tylenol. <laughs> it tastes pretty good actually and so i was just like well that seems to defeat the purpose from a poisoning standpoint however the kid actually the kid didn't have a fever anymore so that was a good thing <laughs> but the question is is you know uh you know does it become a poisoning at that point is it uh, you know an amount uh, that was enough to actually harm the child like you got to figure those things out at that point right so again you have to consider the taste the texture all of that can be really important um but also look at inactive ingredients you know if they have a red dye allergy they may complete uh com uh, prevent, prevent them from getting a whole bunch of different drugs that have red dye in it, right? So for instance, um, we have grape flavored Tylenol. We used to have cherry flavor, which is definitely red, but even the grape flavor, which is kind of purple, has red in it, right? To go back to your primary colors, um, but it has red dye in it. And so we had kids that would come in with a dye allergy. We had to make sure we have dye-free Tylenol. We only use it for like a couple of kids every once in a while, but it is important you have that available, right? If you're dealing with like a pediatric hospital, if, you're, uh, if you just know that person has an allergy, you have to have that available. Um, if yes, that's the thing, then why isn't all, all of it just die through? Um, right some of it has to do with just, um, could be due to the flavoring potentially. Some of it is just, I don't know, they just make them a certain color. Maybe it distinguishes them from other medications, you know, maybe, uh, you think, oh yeah, because like, when I think of like uh, Benadryl, I always know it's a pink liquid, you know, like all the Benadryl packaging is pink, you know, kind of some of the kind of brand recognition there, um, some of it to do with that, but in some cases it just depends. Yeah, I actually don't have a very good answer for that as it turns out. Um, but again, we run into drug, um, we run into medication mix-ups as well, because like certain things will look very much like one another. So for instance, Benadryl comes pink, uh, so does uh, something like uh, chlorhexidine, it's a, kind of a mouth disinfectant. And if you mix those two up, you can give the wrong medication to the kid, right? Because we prepack a lot of uh, meds at the hospital, that's, that's a possibility. So you, you know, make sure you're not just looking at things based on, on color. But uh, other things as well, like what, what else do you think we put into some of these medications to um, make it taste okay? Go back to your Mary Poppins. Put sugar in it, right? So again, sugar helps to make it uh, taste a little bit more palatable. However, some kids cannot receive too much sugar, right? So for instance, maybe a diabetic kid, but more importantly for some of our kids, uh, and whenever we have a ketogenic diet, we've kind of mentioned it in physio already, um, key, 
being in ketosis, you usually put your pH in, in which side of things? More acidic or more alkalotic? Usually more acidic. And you actually can uh, lead to, uh, you have a higher seizure threshold. So for some kids that are very difficult to treat seizures, we'll put them on a ketogenic diet to make them a little bit more acidic to prevent them from having a seizure. And we have to make sure that every single one of their meds has no sugar in it because if we give them too many carbohydrates, they'll kick them out of ketosis and they can have a seizure, right? It's a big deal. Um, so that's one thing we, we have to look at and consider when you're looking at these, these drugs, right? So again, it's a little bit more complicated with the kids than you might think, uh, just based on the fact that a lot of things come, come as these liquid formulations. Okay, so when you're prescribing these meds, it's really important to make sure you have the current weight. That may sound like a no-brainer, but um, you know, in some cases when we have these kids who are coming in uh, emergently, you know, and you go, okay, parents, how, how much do you think the kid weighs? If you ask me right now, I think my two girls probably about 30 pounds, but I could be off five pounds in either direction potentially, right? Because I don't remember specifically the last time we weighed her, how much she weighed. Um, and, and that goes for, for any kid really, you know, uh, or maybe I'm just a bad dad. Either one. <laughs> But you always want to make sure you get uh, the most up-to-date weight. Make sure you're being very consistent if you're doing pounds or kilograms. Again, most people nowadays are using kilograms. So get comfortable working with that and being able to convert between the two. Um, and then also, like, if you're counseling these patients, like, consider, like, you know, bring it down to their level. Obviously, if it's an infant, you can't really communicate too much with them. But make sure your parents are understanding of what they're supposed to do. As they get older, you're going to find they're going to want to be a little bit more in control of their health. And so you can make sure you're trying to, you know, tailor your, your education to a 16-year-old. is going to be a little bit different than it might be to a 12-year-old, et cetera, right? Okay, so let's work on some drug dosing calculations. This is something that's going to be on the exam. You don't need a calculator. This is going to be more complicated than what's going to be on the test, but as long as you can divide and multiply by easy numbers, you're going to be fine. So we'll go over some examples of this. Um, this something we'll need to do on the test. It'll be on your prescription assignment as well. I, think, I believe I put a liquid formulation uh, on there. Now, why do you think I cover this uh, at this point? You need to know it for other classes. You may need to know for other classes. That's important. Um, uh, it could be sadistic. That could be one, right? The sadist. Um, but it's also because, like, it, getting you in practice of doing it now, you're going to be that much better prepared when you go on, on rotations, right? Um, so if you've seen this a lot, if you're able to do these calculations pretty much in your head or, or, or very easily uh, with some scratch paper, you're going to feel much more confident when you're actually out there and they say, hey, write a prescription for amoxicillin for this kid. You know, you're going to be able to do that and not get freaked out when you're looking at, okay, this is this concentration, the kid weighs this much, and how much volume am I going to, you need to be able to, to kind of figure that out. And so a lot of people, when they're dealing, especially if you're dealing like an adult facility, um, I always remember when I was doing my fellowship, we were primarily an adult ER, we had a PEDS ER, but every time a kid came in coding, it was always the most high stress, um, most uh, probably error prone environment you've ever been in because everyone's freaked out because they're like, what if I get the wrong dose? What if I do give the, the wrong thing? And so getting you comfortable that now is going to help you out when you're in rotations later. So we're going to do this when you're doing prescription assignments in Farm 1 and Farm 2. I'm always going to include one of these liquid medications on here um, as a peach prescription to make sure you're, you're comfortable with it. Okay. So this is going to be the basis of it. And here's how and you're going to do every single drug the same way, essentially. Okay. So let's say, for instance, we have a 15 kilogram child, right? Uh, and they're requiring amoxicillin. They have a case of acute otitis media. Uh, amoxicillin, what kind of that drug do you think that is? Antibiotic. Antibiotic, yep, perfect. It's in the same family as penicillin, absolutely good. So uh, I guess they're already drug experts, as it turns out, right? Anyway, <laughs> let's say, for instance, the dose is going to be 90 milligrams per kilogram divided BID, which means how many times a day? Twice a day, right? So I'm going to give 90 milligrams per kilogram divided BID. That means each dose should be how much? 45 milligrams per kilogram. Perfect. Okay. Now say our suspension comes as amoxicillin suspension 400 milligrams per 5 mLs. Why do you think they put it per 5 mLs? Remember how much a teaspoon was? 5 mL. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of drug packaging will still come as like per 5 mLs, and that's usually due to the fact that um, they're still thinking like in a teaspoon sort of uh, mantra there. So again, I, I hate that. I really wish they would just express it as you know 80 milligrams per mL. That makes it much easier when we're doing our calculations here, but kind of keep that in mind. Uh, make sure that when you see that per 5, like you need to divide by 5 to get the per mL amount uh, for that concentration. Make sense? Okay, so the question, how much should this child receive per dose? Okay, so how would you, how would you start this problem out? How would you do that? work it out? Do what? 90, 90 Perfect. Yeah. So the first step would be just do 90 times 15. Do I include it on the next slide? I can't remember. I actually put out the steps. Yeah, did. I did? All right. Perfect. Let's go to do that then. Okay. So yeah. So basically what we're going to figure out is how much you're actually going to get per day. That's kind of the first step here. So we said 90 times 15 because it gets 15 kilograms and you get 90 milligrams per kilogram per day. Okay. It's important to make sure you keep your units straight. You're going to equal out to be 1350. So we're going to get 1,350 milligrams of amoxicillin per day. Okay. And then we said we're going to give a BID. So you have to divide that by two. And so then we're going to get a dose of 675 milligrams per dose. Okay. So is that what you write on a prescription? 
No, what am I going to write on the prescription? The volume they're going to actually administer. Because again, the parent, you don't want the parents have to figure that out. They know how much they actually need to draw up into that dosing syringe to administer to the child, right? So now how do I figure out, how do I get from the dose to the actual volume I'm going to administer? Divide by 80, right? And how do we get there? Because the concentration is? Yeah, so 400 divided by 5 is? 80. So I know it's 80 milligrams per ml of amoxicillin. So I'm going to take that uh, 675. I'm going to divide that by, by 80, essentially, right? So I'm going to take that 600, uh, 675 milligrams per dose. I'm going to get my concentration here, figure it out, and I do 675 divided by 80. And so I know my milligrams are going to cancel out. And so I'm going to receive, uh, get this dose here of 8.4 mLs per dose. Okay. Now, again, this is a lot more accurate than saying just give a teaspoon and a half or something like that. You want to make sure you're very specific with your dose. So it's at 8.4 mLs. Now, if it was 8 mLs, how would I write that out? I write 8.0. Yeah, remember you don't want to you don't never want to have a trailing zero on those cases. You just write eight, and that would be fine. Uh, in this case, uh, 8.4 mLs per dose would be the dose we're going to administer. Okay, makes sense. As about as straightforward as you come with with a lot of these uh, drug dosing calculations. And again, these same steps are going to apply each each uh, time you do it. Okay, everyone with me so far? Now let's say we have a, an 18 kilogram patient who need, uh, needs an antihistamine. Uh, it's an H2 blocker called Zantac or ranitidine for GERD symptoms. Right, GERD symptoms being gastroesophageal reflux disease, right? So he's having some, some, uh, you know, some upset stomach. He's having some, some nasty burps there. So we're going to give him some, some Zantac to help with that. Okay. Now in this case, we're going to find that the dose is going to be four milligrams per kilogram per day divided BID. And then the syrup itself comes as a 15 milligram per mile concentration. So the question is how much should they receive per dose? So the first step being 18 kilograms times four milligrams per kilogram per day. Good. So we're getting a total amount. Did I put it on the next slide? That one I didn't. Okay, good. So let's do uh, do the math here. Here. All right. So we're gonna do 18 times four is 72 milligrams. Perfect. So we're gonna have 72 milligrams uh, per day. So we need to do what at that point? All right. So 72 divided by two. 72 divided by two equals 36. Perfect. And then I can do what at that point? Yeah. So I take 36 milligrams per dose, and then I'm gonna divide that by 15, which is what? Yeah, so, and again, with usually with pediatric calculations, you can fudge it a little bit, usually within 10% or so. So if you said 2 mLs, that's probably pretty good. That's, that's probably fine at that point, right? Um, that makes sense? You with me? But 2.4 mLs will be the very exact dose you want to go ahead and give there. If you end up doing 2, I'd probably, eh, whatever, that's probably good enough, right? Um, so, again, 2.4. Everyone get that same answer? Okay. Let's say, okay, this one gets a little bit more complicated. So let's say we're given, uh, anyone heard of the, the antibiotic Bactrim? Mm -hmm. Or um, uh, Ceptra is the other one, another brand name for that uh, for the same drug combination. Basically, it's a combination of two drugs called trimethoprim and then sulfamethoxazole. Again, we'll go into the mechanism of the Bactrim, we'll go over side effects, all that stuff in Farm 1. Uh, but here, just for our purposes, just know it's a combination drug, these two antibiotics. And so basically, we're going to have a 12-kilo patient. They have cellulitis, and we're going to give them this drug for that. Now, notice here, this is going to be 4 milligrams of TMP, which is a way we're going to abbreviate trimethoprim, per kilogram per dose, twice a day. Right? Actually, I had one of the second-year students come up, and they're still having some troubles with this. Anytime you're dealing with a drug that's a combination like this, the dosing is going to be based off of one component of that. Okay, Because these come as a fixed ratio, it never changes. Um, you can dose it based off of one component. So if I were to look this up in a drug reference like uh, Lexicomp or Micromedics, wherever it happens to be, it would say you're going to dose it as four milligrams of TMP per kilogram per dose. Every reference you look at, it'll base it off of the trimethoprim component. Okay. So just know that when you see a combination like that, it's going to be based off of one of those comp uh, those compounds. Okay. So anyway, so let's say we're going to do four milligrams of trimethoprim per kilogram per dose, BID, and we know it comes as a combination product of sulfamethoxyl 200 milligrams and trimethoprim 40 milligrams per 5 mLs. So the question is how much should the child receive? What's the first step? Good, so 12 times 4. Ah, so okay, so let's, let's, let's review that. So we're going to do 12 times 4. So it should be 48 milligrams of trimethoprim per dose right read this trimethoprim per kilogram per dose it's not per day this is something that gets people tripped up quite frequently even in the clinical world um, if you're not used to seeing this you got to be careful with your units here so this is four milligrams of trimethoprim per kilogram per dose twice a day so do i need to divide by two in this case 
Mm -mm. No, I just know they're going to get 48 milligrams of trimethoprim twice a day. Once in the morning, once at night, usually, okay? Okay, so now just make sure you're reading that, whether it's per day or per dose. In this case, we're going to see that um, the trimethoprim component is what we're dosing it off of. So if I'm just going to take 40 divided by 5 and I get 8, so then I can take 48 milligrams divided by... Yep, 48 divided by 8, and I get 6 mL. So that kid should receive 6 mL. BID. BID twice a day, right? So again, 6 mL twice a day is how you would write that prescription out. Okay? Make sense? Be very careful when you're looking at your units, whether it's uh, milligrams per kilogram per day or whether it's per dose. Okay? Okay, let's say, for instance, uh, we have a parent who came up and they, you know, their kids uh, coming up, they have, they have a cold and they have the fever, um, and uh, a fever, not the fever. Got a fever, no. Um, anyway, uh, let's say, we, for instance, we have a 20 kilogram kid here is receiving two teaspoons of acetaminophen four times a day for a fever. The mom wants to know, hey, is it, are you dosing this appropriately? And this is actually a good question to ask people. And they say, oh, my kid's fever just won't break. Go back and ask them, well, what are you using? Oh, you use Tylenol. How much? They can tell you that. You may be able to find out if they're underdosing, overdosing, whatever it happens to be. You want to be able to be clear on that, make sure they're being treated appropriately. So let's say we have a 20-kilogram kid getting uh, two teaspoons of acetaminophen four times a day for fever. We know that the usual dose is 15 mg per kilogram per dose. And we know the concentration here is 160 per 5. It's 160 divided by 5. 32 milligrams. Yeah, it drives me crazy. I don't know. Why can't you just make it 30? Why has it got to be 32 milligrams per month? But that's the standard acetaminophen concentration for any kind of liquids. Now, there used to be like an infant form and there used to be a pediatric form uh, that had different concentrations. What do you think was the problem there? If I gave the wrong one to the wrong kid, I can either get an overdose or I can get an underdose there. So to get rid of that, to get rid of that issue, they, may, they standardize it. That way, every single form of liquid tiny only find out there is going to be that same 32 milligrams per mole concentration, okay, which is a good thing. We want things to be as standardized as possible for our, our patients there, right? So the question is, is the kid being uh, adequately dosed? Let's go ahead and figure that out. So let's say um, we have a uh, – how much is he getting in this case? So how much volume is he receiving uh, four times a day? So it's two teaspoons. Per dose, right? Two teaspoons is how much? That's 10 mLs, right? So again, we would know that 5 mLs uh, per teaspoon. So we'd say, okay, the kid's getting 10 mLs. And that 10 mLs would equate to how much Tylenol? So it's a 32 milligram per mL concentration. Yeah, so you're getting 320 milligrams of Tylenol every uh, every six hours, essentially, right? Four times a day is the same as every four hours. Or I'm sorry, every six hours. See, even I get that screwed up. Four times a day, every six hours. So, okay, so he's getting 320 milligrams. So then how do we figure out if he's getting the right dose or not? So we need to figure out how many milligrams per kilogram he's actually getting. So we take that 320 and then divide it by 320 divided by the weight of the child. So we do divide it by 20. And that gives us 16. So he's getting 16 milligrams per kilogram four times a day. Does that seem appropriate? Well, what's the dose they're supposed to get? 15, close enough, pretty good, right? within 10%. percent i say that's okay, right? So, uh, you know, they're doing 16 mix, because again, a lot of the dosing you're going to see out there will be, uh, especially on the packaging, let's say I give one teaspoon, two teaspoons, um, and that's usually going to be based on like a wide variety of weights there. So there's a little bit of fudge factor there, right? It's not uh, going to be an exact science. Um, so, you know, that would, I would say, hey, yeah, 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 you're giving the right amount. That's totally fine. Maybe they're just still having fever for whatever reason, okay? So those are the kind of things you do. Um, this is kind of the probably the more common calculation I'll do where a provider will put in a dose, and I have to go back and check it to make sure it's right based on the mix per kilogram amount, right, to make sure that that's the right dose for that patient. Does that make sense? Okay. Other thing, um, and you guys will look like rock stars when you get on rotations, if you can know this. If you know how to give IV fluids to a patient, uh, especially a pediatric patient, um, you'll, you'll look golden because a lot of people don't know this even if they the first couple of years they're out, unless they work with peds exclusively. Um, so usually for a fluid bolus, and when I say fluid bolus, what does that mean? Yeah, kind of one big dose of fluids. That's usually when you're trying to fluid resuscitate someone, you're giving them one big dose, essentially. And so a fluid bolus uh, for a pediatric patient across the board, it's 20 mLs per kilogram. Okay, it's a good number to remember. If they have, like, maybe kidney issues, they can't receive that much fluids, maybe do it by half. Maybe do 10 mL, uh, mLs per kilogram. Because when you think of like an adult patient, how much do you normally give? You normally think of one liter, two liters. This makes it a little bit more specific. So we're saying 20 mLs per kilogram. That way we make sure we don't give a liter to a neonate. Uh, we make sure we can give, if we need to give more than a liter, we can give that to bigger kids, right? And the other question is we're going to do maintenance IV fluids as well. So maintenance IV fluids just means what do you think? 
Yeah, there's something that will be on continuously, right? So again, I give them a fluid bolus, I resuscitate them, I uh, refill that intravascular space, usually using normal saline, a 0.9% sodium chloride, and I put them on a maintenance fluid rate and just go ahead and keep them on that for until maybe they can take oral again or whatever uh, whatever purpose. Um, and so this is going to follow the 421 rule, okay? Again, you can't go wrong if you use the 421 rule. So um, this basically means for the first 10 kilograms of the child's weight, they're going to get 4 mLs per kilo per hour. For the second 10 kilograms, they're going to get 2 mLs per kilo per hour. And then for every kilogram after that, they're going to get 1 mL per kilo per hour. It sounds complicated. Once you do it a couple of times and get some practice, it'll make sense. Um, so for instant, if, uh, instance, we had a four, um, sorry, an 8 kilogram infant, how much of a fluid bolus would they get? So you take 8 kilograms times 20, so it should get 160 mLs, right? That would be their fluid bolus. Give them 160 mLs of NS, you program that on the pump and run in, and they're good, right? Um, how, what would their maintenance rate be? Hmm? Yeah, it would be 32, because again, they're under 10 kilograms, so they would just get 4 mLs per kilo for their entire weight at that point, right? So again, it'd be 4 times 8, which is 32 mLs per hour, right? You always want to keep your units straight. You don't want to say per minute, because I guess what? It's a whole lot faster at that point. So we want to say per hour, okay? Uh, let's say we had a 1,200 gram neonate. Well, that's how many kilograms? Yeah, 1.2. So remember your conversions there, right? So I uh, have a 1.2 kilogram neonate. What would be their fluid bolus? Like 24, right? 24 ml. So again, a very small amount. We don't, we're not giving a whole lot of volume to these, these kids here. And then how much uh, of a maintenance rate would they get? Yeah, you just do 4 mLs per kilo per hour times their weight, 1.2, and you get 4.8 mLs an hour, right? Okay. Let's go a little bit bigger, okay? Let's say we have a 45 uh, kilogram adolescent. Let's say, how much would their fluid bolus be in this case? 900. Yeah, they get 900 ml, so almost a liter. If you gave them a liter, probably wouldn't kill them, but you know, to be exact, they would get 900 ml as a fluid bolus, and then how much of a maintenance rate would they get? So this is where you start to break it down by their, the uh, tens of kilos. In this case, for that first 10 kilograms of that weight, it would be four mLs per kilo per hour, or it'd be 40 mLs per hour, right? For the second 10 kilograms, it'd be 2 mLs per kilo per hour, or 20 in this case, so 20 mLs per hour. So now we already have 40 mLs per hour plus 20 mLs per hour. Now we've got to get the remainder of that kid's weight, which is how much we have left over. We have 25 kilograms left over, and so now we just do 1 mL per kilo per hour for that. So we do 25 times 1, so they have 25 mLs. So we get 40 plus 20 plus 25. That's how much? 85 mLs an hour, right? So you do 85 mLs an hour, and that would be a fine maintenance rate for them, okay? Sometimes you give more than that, sometimes you give less, but you can't really go wrong if you do uh, the standard sort of maintenance rate following that 4-2-1 rule, okay? What about a 100-kilogram teenager? So you do 2 liters, so that's 2,000, 2,000 mLs, 2 liters. Does that seem appropriate? So remember with fluids, one thing we'll cover is that you can always give more, right? You can't necessarily take it back once it's in the patient. You know, it's maybe a case where you need to, depending on the clinical situation, give all two liters. Maybe I'll just start with one liter and then maybe give more after that, right? This is where you start to butt up against the adult dosing and you typically don't want to exceed the normal adult dosing. Some adults can take one to two liters, but it depends on the clinical situation here. But right, two to a thousand mLs would be that calculated fluid bolus. Now, what would the maintenance rate be in this case? So for the first 10, we're going to get 40 mLs per hour, right? Because again, it's 4 mLs per kilo per hour. But the next 10 kilograms, we 20 mLs per hour, right? Is that how much we have left over now? We have 80, so we have 40 plus 20 plus 80. So how much? 140 mLs per hour, right? And so again, you can do these in your head pretty quick as soon as you get kind of comfortable. So you can make up any weight patient you want and figure out what their maintenance and, and bolus rates are going to be because we'll, we'll do this all the time where we have a patient who's being rushed into the ER, they're critically ill, they're like, oh, we need a fluid bolus, how much are we going to give them? Um, you know, and, and you need to come up with that dose pretty quick and then, okay, we're going to put them on maintenance rates. How much do they get? And, and so having those rules kind of ingrained in your mind and get some practice with it will be very helpful for you, especially when on rotations. And someone's like, well, how much fluid should you give? And you'll be like, all right, I already know the answer to that. So we'll do this uh, quite a bit through throughout um, uh, farm and whatnot. Okay, any questions on that? Make sense? One, uh, one thing I sometimes butt up against it, or I run into, at least from a, uh, the ER standpoint, is sometimes like, you know, well, how much 
volume can I give a patient? How much, uh, what's my max dose that I'm allowed to give to a patient? So this is one example we run into in the ER somewhat frequently is we have a lot of kids who come in with lacerations um, and we need to stitch them up, right? But uh, how do we deal with that pain associated with all that? Well, we can try to numb up the area by giving a local anesthetic. So I'm sure most people have heard of the drug lidocaine before, right? So again, we use it to try to numb up the patients. That way they uh, cannot feel when we're, um, you know, the pain associated with the injury and then also when we're trying to stitch it up. So um, this is one of those cases where um, there's a max dose, and usually I'll have because over at the uh, over at Nemours we actually have a program. It's called the the Boo Boo Squad, where basically we have paramedics who are trained up on how to do uh, lacerations repair, and it's really good because it actually helps to free up the other providers to go see more patients, essentially, right? So they're actually really good at what they do. But they'll come up and like, hey, I got this patient that weigh this much. How much lidocaine can I give them, right? Because you want to give too much, you can run into issues like cardiac toxicity, CNS toxicity, no good. So what we'll end up doing is trying to figure out this uh, from a calculation standpoint. So we'll say, okay, let's say we have a 24 kilogram patient uh, has a laceration to the face. How much lidocaine can I inject into that area to try to numb it up before I run into issues here? And so, um, you know, the first thing you gotta figure out is what's the concentration of the drug you're dealing with? And so lidocaine is one of those things that is frequently described as a percentage, right? So 1% lidocaine or 2% lidocaine. A quick rule, and one thing I think will, uh, will help you whenever you're looking at these drug concentrations is how to convert this percentage into an actual milligram per ml amount, right? Just like we were doing with the oral liquids here. So the, the quick rule, I'll show you here. Does anyone, when I say 1%, anyone know what that means? Basically means that one gram per 100 mLs. It's not really a very helpful sort of calculation. So the, the handy rule of thumb that was taught to me by one of the smartest people I ever knew, Dr. Kunisaki, I pass on to you now. It's very helpful when you're doing concentrations of drugs. If you see 1%, all you have to do is move the decimal place over one spot to the right. Okay, so with 1%, if I move that decimal place, so I would say imagine 1.0, which again, I don't like leading zeros, but I'm gonna use it in this case, or I'm sorry, trailing zeros. I'm gonna move this over to the right. And so that's gonna give me my milligram per ml concentration. So 1% solution is how many, how many milligrams per ml? Just 10, yeah, exactly. Or if, hey, for instance, I was doing with a 2% solution, move it over one spot to the right, 20 milligrams per ml, right? How about, for instance, with um, uh, sodium chloride, I mentioned normal saline is zero, 0.9, again, I apologize for my terrible handwriting, at 0.9%, better than, I'm getting better practice with this. Um, how many milligrams per ml of sodium chloride do I have when I um, convert that over? Just nine, yeah, nine milligrams uh, of sodium chloride per, per ml in that case, right? Does that make sense? So again, you can do this, any drug expresses a percentage. Um, you can even do this with your alcohols potentially. If you're doing hard liquors, you can figure out how much alcohol is in per ml uh, of all those solutions, right? Not that you guys ever have any uh, time to, to deal with any of that stuff, but you could potentially as a, as a neat party trick or to bore your your, uh, your, your friends. Anyway, um, it's a long four hours. I get a little, little punchy. Anyway, so the question is, all right, so I can figure out how many milligrams per ml my, my concentration is as a drug. It's 10 milligrams per ml. That's a, that's a given now. Um, and so the max amount that I can give to this patient is five milligrams per kilogram. So how much lidocaine could I potentially give to that patient? Yeah, I can give 120 milligrams. So I just take that 24 and I multiply that by five, right? That's going to be the max amount that I can use. And so uh, 120 milligrams would be the max that I can give that patient. So then the question is, well, how many mLs is that going to be? Yeah, so it's 120 milligrams divided by that concentration of 10 milligrams per ml. And now I got 12 mLs. So I can tell that paramedic or whoever's doing the laceration pair, you can use up to 12 mLs uh, for this laceration, particularly if it's a particularly large one or you need to really get that area numb. Um, I can tell them that so that way they don't exceed that and potentially have toxicity, but they can get in and, and give as much as they need to to really numb up the patient, right? That makes sense? Just something I deal with uh, from the emergency medicine sort of standpoint uh, on a somewhat a routine basis there. Yeah. Okay, so any questions? on that. All right.